all of the science information you'll ever need in 15 minutes or less. You're listening to The Science Show with Angel Masters on the Perimeter Podcasting Network. and welcome to the new episode of The Science Show here at Perimeter College at Georgia State University. I am your host, Angel Masters, and I hope that everyone had a pleasant and relaxing spring break, and I know y'all are looking forward to the end of the semester, because I know I am. The first thing I would like to mention today before we get started is the Classic Boat Race. This is the inaugural classic design competition of the Cardboard Boat Regatta. And by classic, I don't mean classic spelled C-L-A-S-S-I-C. I I mean classic C-L-A-C-E-C, the Clarkston Computing and Engineering Club. This is a boat race sponsored by Classic that will be held here on campus in the pool on Saturday, April 9th, 2016 from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Here's how it works. You form an engineering design team of four to five members. All must be current perimeter college students. Register your team members, sign your safety waivers, meet with your team to plan a boat design for race day. And on April 9th, your team will have two and a half hours to build a cardboard boat using only cardboard, duct tape, and a box cutter. And then you and your team will paddle your boat across the pool. And may the best team win. If you are interested in the inaugural Classic Cardboard Boat Regatta, please email classic.gpc, that's C-L-A-C-E-C dot G-P-C at gmail.com, or visit Professor Shapiro in CH3261. All right, let's move on. Now, after our last episode, I really didn't think I'd have to comment on this again. Then again, who am I kidding? Selfies with animals, people, it's not okay. I mean, sometimes it's okay, and by sometimes I mean only if your own dog or cat or other domesticated creature signs that release form saying they don't mind if you plaster their cuteness all over the internet. However, if it lives its life outside of your own home, please, oh please, leave it alone. As if the endangered baby dolphin weren't enough, we've got a guy dragging a shark out of the ocean in Florida a woman dragging a swan out of a lake in Macedonia, and visitors to a Chinese zoo not only having a photo shoot with a peacock, but pulling out its feathers. Enough. Seriously, if it can't answer your question in your native language, leave it alone. If it does answer you, please call me. We'll have an entire episode dedicated to talking animals. I'm not kidding. All right, let's do some space news before we come back to Earth and perhaps get a little political. On March 1st, American astronaut Scott Kelly and Russian cosmonaut Mikhail Kornienko returned to Earth after a historic 340-day mission aboard the International Space Station. During their year on the station, these guys participated in numerous studies and research projects that, amongst other things, investigated how the human body reacts to long periods in space. Important stuff to know when we're talking about future missions to Mars. Now that he's back on his home planet, Kelly will continue to participate in NASA research as part of its twin studies, as in studies on twins, which will look at the effects of space, both body and mind, on Scott in comparison to his identical twin brother, former astronaut Mark Kelly. There is a ton more info on all of this on NASA's website, nasa.gov, and you can take a look at some of Scott's amazing photos from his time on the station by checking him out on Twitter and Instagram. His handle on both is stationcdrkelly. And speaking of NASA and some really cool stuff, the design studio at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory has come up with a beautiful set of faux travel posters, a continuation of the Exoplanet Travel Bureau series that they designed last year, and you can download and print these retro-style beauties from JPL's homepage. It's hard to describe them over the airwaves, but if you're a fan of sci-fi, or space, or travel, or art, or any combination of those things, check out JPL's website at jpl.nasa.gov slash visions of the future to see what I'm talking about. One more thing before we head back to the home planet. 
Ceres is the largest object in the asteroid belt. It sits about 250 million light years from us between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, and it's about 4.6 billion years old. There's a lot of interesting stuff on Ceres, like a giant pyramid that dwarfs many of our Earth-bound mountains, and a 50-mile-wide crater that houses some weird, dazzling bright spots. We learned about all of this last year when the Dawn spacecraft fell into Ceres' orbit and sent us back some of its vacation photos. However, in tandem with the Dawn research, astronomers at the INAF Trieste Astronomical Observatory in Italy have discovered some even more interesting stuff about those aforementioned bright spots. Using the European Southern Observatory's 3.6-meter telescope, the research team has noticed that the brightness of the spots is not consistent. They get brighter and then dim back down, and they are the most bright when they're facing the sun. Now, thanks to CHEM-1, we know that sublimation is the transformation of a solid into a gas, and that's exactly what the team thinks is going on on Ceres. A vast underground ocean that is filling up the cracks in the crust, which then turn to ice or salt crystals or something else, which are then sublimed when the heat from the light of the sun hits and the light reflecting off the resulting mist or vapor is what causes the flare and brightness, which then dims as the mist evaporates. The researchers published a report in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society and a press release through the Trieste Observatory, which, to be honest, I don't claim to fully understand, but the gist of them seems to be that yes, we know that there is water under the surface of Ceres, but we didn't know if it reaches the surface, and these firefly-like flares could be a possible explanation. More on this as I hear about it. And now back to Earth, and the part of the show where I try not to get too political. I don't want to start a debate about climate change, because you only have to read the headlines each day to know that it's an argument over which everyone has an opinion, and we all know the general theories on opinions and what they smell like. I do, however, want to talk a little about a few things that are happening these days on our little spinning rock in our quiet corner of the universe, and how we don't seem to be doing such a great job of keeping the place up and running like it should be. First, as promised on the last episode, earthquakes. In Oklahoma. I don't know about you, but when I think of earthquakes, I think of California. You know, the San Andreas Fault, the place where we've come to expect earthquakes. And when I think of Oklahoma, tornadoes are more of the natural phenomenon that I expect to hear about. Now, are there fault lines in Oklahoma? Yes, actually, a bunch, just as there are pretty much all over the place. But these are really old and haven't been active until recently for hundreds of millions of years. According to researchers, including the United States Geological Survey, it's more than a little possible that the recent spate of earthquakes, over 900 of a magnitude 3 or higher in 2015 alone, and a 5.1 magnitude in January of this year, could be the result of two things, wastewater injection or hydraulic fracturing, which, alarmingly, could have reactivated these previously dormant fault lines. The research and investigation into this is obviously still ongoing, but you can read more about it on the U.S. Geological Survey website at usgs.gov. Let's move on to the oceans and a recent report with, you've guessed it, alarming implications. The Seattle Times reported in February on a juvenile Chinook salmon that was caught in Puget Sound in September of 2014 with a veritable laundry list of drugs in its system that were likely picked up from wastewater in the area. The list goes on and on, 81 drugs in total, and includes everything from over-the-counter medications like Aleve and Tylenol to narcotic painkillers like Oxycontin to caffeine, nicotine, antiseptics, Valium, and, quote, antibiotics galore. While people don't generally eat juvenile Chinook salmon, so we wouldn't be ingesting this fun little cocktail from snacking on this little guy, this stuff is in our water, and water treatment facilities, by their own admission, don't get everything out. Which is, like I've said, alarming. One last thing, and then I promise a little good news to end the show. It's spring, clearly, and it got here a little early, perhaps, is what we all seem to be thinking. Well, yeah. And scientists are a little lost for words, because this February, the month that just ended a month ago, was so hot by such a large margin that it has now been recorded as the most above normal month since meteorologists started keeping track of such things in 1880, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. That's 136 years ago. And February of 2016 was warmer than 125 of the last 136 months of March worldwide. 
And it's not just NOAA doing the reporting. NASA is reporting the same thing, along with a research team from the University of Alabama at Huntsville and the private remote sensing system. Alarming is also the watchword in this case. Seth Borenstein of the Associated Press spoke via email with Georgia Tech climate scientist Kim Cobb, who said that she normally doesn't concern herself much with the new high temperature records that are broken regularly. However, she added, when I look at the new February 2016 temperatures, I feel like I'm looking at something out of a sci-fi movie. In a way, we are. It's like someone plucked a value off a graph from 2030 and stuck it on a graph of present temperatures. It is a portent of things to come, and it is sobering that such temperature extremes are already on our doorstep. So there's that. Want a little good news before I go? I know I do. Butterflies. Monarch butterflies, specifically. They appeared to be making a comeback after a period of decline which resulted in a loss of 90% of the population since the mid-1990s. But, according to reports from researchers at the Mexican National Commission of Protected Natural Areas and the World Wildlife Fund, there has been a 225% increase from 2015 to 2016 in common habitat areas. So, hooray for that. And finally, a tentative hooray and many thanks to El Nino for a hopeful dent in the four-year drought in California. Snowpack in the mountains now stands at 92% of normal statewide, and the state's largest lakes and reservoirs, Lake Shasta, Oroville, and Folsom, among others, have surpassed their 15-year historic averages. That's not to say that they're at capacity, but if the rains continue, they very well could be by April, which is very good news, both for California and the nation as a whole. And there you have it. Another day, another science show. I'll be back in a couple of weeks, probably with some news about how to get involved with the science show through social media. But until then, send your comments, questions, hate mail, whatever, to me, Angel, here at the Collegian at collegiannews.com. As always, have a great week, study hard, register for the classic boat race, and if you do nothing else, read. The Science Show has been executive produced by London Balbosa and written by Angel Masters. The Science Show has been a presentation of the Perimeter Podcast Network from the Collegian Newspaper at Georgia State's Perimeter College. For more news, interviews, and other information about the college, you can visit them online at collegiannews.com as well as the Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram pages. And for more podcasts, you can visit our podcast page at soundcloud.com slash GSU Perimeter Pod and our YouTube channel Perimeter Pod Net. Hey everyone, it's Ben Abrams, the executive editor from the Collegian and one of the creators of the newly named Perimeter Pod Network. And I'm here just to talk about some of the stuff that will be happening at Perimeter over the next couple of weeks. On uh, April 6th at 5 p.m., the uh, film club will be having its annual film festival over in the Jim Cherry Lecture Center. will be the uh, downstairs library lobby on the Clarkson campus. If you don't know where that is, that is the uh, building with all the glass windows, uh, you know, on it right next to the campus cafe. But anyway, uh, like I said, annual film festival. Uh, students will get to participate and vote on which short film they like the best. Go down and check it out myself, and I'm really looking forward to it. Also, on April 7th, the Art Club will be having its annual art exhibit in the gallery of the F building on the Clarkson campus. This is when, you know, talented members of the art club will get to showcase the art for, you know, people to come in to see. You know, another great event, get to showcase good local talent. And finally, uh, our friends over from the uh, and wellness recreation centers, uh, you know, they gave us some things that they wanted us to pass on to some other folks. Uh, right now, until April 27th, they got an outdoor intramural soccer league that is going on right now over on the uh, soccer field. You know, right next to the parking deck and right next to the football stadium. Uh, that's where, you know, the Lady Jags used to play their ball, uh, you know, before uh, the consolidation happened. But anyway, uh, like I said, just some really good things going on right now. If it's anything like direct basketball league, you're bound to see some good action. So I would say go on over there, check it out. They also got one going on Dunwoody right now. And actually, 
interesting thing is is that you know when they do the playoffs they're going to kind of have this world cup of, of a perimeter thing going on right now where the uh, clarkson winner will play the dirty one winner for the championship game uh, also going on from the uh wellness and rec center some fitness classes that uh, will be going on from now until the end of the month room cg014 on the clarkson campus we have yoga that goes from now until april 27th uh, you can catch that every monday and wednesday from 11 30 to 12 30 p.m we also have aqua zumba which will be happening in room cg 11 30 on the clarkson campus uh, that'll be going from now until the 28th you can catch those on monday and wednesday from 5 15 to 6 15 and cardio kickboxing which will be happening in room cg 0140 the same room as yoga you can uh catch that from now until april 28th and that will be on tuesday and thursday evenings from 5 30 to 6 30 p.m and finally for anyone who's uh, maybe looking for a relaxing uh activity they can do even just to uh you know get their mind off of classes they also have a walking program which will be going on right now uh, until april 22nd uh, they have some prizes for uh, anyone who can uh you know walk 10 15 uh, 30 even 50 miles so you know anyone looking just to, for an activity that just help them blow off some steam or you know get their mind off things or even just to relax uh, like i said this walking program might be a good fit for you for more information check out coach robert edwards he's at uh, downstairs in the g building on the clarkson campus or you can get in touch with jonetta kelly at jonetta.kelly at gpc.edu again jonetta.kelly at gpc at edu all right so like i said a lot of great things happening here around the uh, campuses of perimeter and uh, just go check them out and if there's anything that uh, you'd like to let us know feel free to reach out to us on our uh, collegian facebook page or on our twitter page and just let us know about some stuff that's happening around the area